yes, it is World Autism Week and World Autism Day is on the 2nd. So it's a really special week to be coming and talking to you. Um, my name is Elle and hopefully some of you know me, but if you don't, I've written a book called A Kind of Spark, which is this one here, and a new one called Show Us Who You Are, which came out just a couple of weeks ago. So it's pretty brand new. Um, and I think some of you, as your teacher just said, know a kind of spark. Um, I'm not gonna talk for too long because I love when people have questions and just wanna say now that if you just wanna think about any kind of question you wanna ask, definitely does not have to be about me or my book. If you have questions about being a writer, if you have questions about neurodiversity, if you have questions about publishing, anything at all, feel free to ask me. There's no silly questions. Uh, trust me, it's the grown-ups in publishing that ask all the silly questions and not kids at school. So feel free to ask whatever you want. So, like I said, I'm a writer and this is my first book. This came out in June last year and there's quite a long story as to why this book was written, but I'll start with when I was your age um, at school, I loved reading. I loved our library. I loved, I, I mean, I just was an absolute bookworm and I would spend lunch times and after school in the library. Quite sad, but you know, that was that was my life for, for my school career. I loved reading and I started, the more I read, to notice that there was a certain type of person in books and there were people who were not in books. And hopefully some of you know what I mean by that, but I was a neurodivergent kid. I am now a neurodivergent adult. But when I was little, I didn't see people in books who were like me. I never saw the word neurodivergent. I never saw the word autistic. And I started to feel quite sad about it because I loved reading so much and I loved books and I loved stories. And I thought, wow, this thing I love so much, writers and publishers don't seem to think I belong in here. And it, it made me quite sad. Um, but I put that to one side and I, and I finished school and I went and I lived in New York for a little while, which is a whole other story. Um, and then when I came back, I thought, well, I'd like to work in publishing, which is, I'm sure you all know, the industry that publishes and makes books. They're the people that decide who gets to be a writer and who doesn't. And I said, I'll be in publishing and then I can be an editor, which is somebody who helps writers finish the book. And I said, I'll be an editor and I will personally see to it that a lot of the writers I see will, will be you know, autistic writers or neurodivergent writers. And I'll make sure that they get to be in books just as much as everybody else. That was the dream. And then it got quite complicated because I was in lots of interview rooms in London saying exactly what I just said to you guys saying, you know, I think there needs to be more neurodivergent representation in kids books. I think kids deserve to see all kinds of people in stories, people with all different kinds of brains, um, not just the same thing over and over again. And I thought, you know, this is great. The people in these rooms, they'll agree with me and they'll go, oh, of course, why didn't we see this all along? But that did not happen. And I was met with a lot of people who were looking at me like I was a bit mad and going, that's, that's not anything that we're interested in. And, and they would say things like, you know, books like that wouldn't sell. Books like that, you know, Waterstones wouldn't like books like that. People who wouldn't buy those books. Readers don't like that. And then they said, and also, neurodivergent people don't read books or write them. And that was, that was the moment that everything changed and it was like a fire had been lit. Um, maybe some of you know what that feels like, but it made me so angry. And I thought that's absolute rubbish. I'm a neurodivergent person. I read everything, I write all the time. I'm not special in that sense. I know lots of neurodivergent people, people who are autistic, people who have ADHD, all these different things are very creative. That's absolute rubbish that they are telling me. So I thought, wow, maybe publishing is not for me if all of these people feel that way. And I and I went home and I said to my, you know, my my family and my I said, I don't know if I can keep doing this. This is really hard, um, really sad. And uh, and someone said, Well, just just go on one last try, one one final try. And there was this great little publisher in Brixton, in London, where I live, and very small, and they only publish books that are about people who are a bit different. And I thought, well, 
if anyone's going to listen to me, it's probably them. So I set up a meeting with them and I said, hey, I want to be an editor or in publishing in some way. And I really want to see more books about kids who are autistic, kids who are, have learning difficulties, kids like me, um, because we don't have a lot of representation in books or in TV or in anything. And I think it needs to change. I think it really needs to change. And they said, well, we agree with you. We don't have any jobs, but if you've written a book, we'd love to read it. And I thought, oof, I never thought about being a writer, but you know, I went home and I, I pulled out an old manuscript that I'd been working on a little bit and I sent them that and I said, you know, is this what you, you maybe would like to read? And they said, absolutely. And that book was A Kind of Spark. And A Kind of Spark came out, like I said, in June. And if you remember everything I just said about what everyone said about books about autistic characters, so for those of you that don't know, Kind of Spark is about a girl called Addie, and she campaigns in her small town for a memorial to be made in honour of witches, and she is autistic, and so is her big sister Kitty. So there's two autistic people in it, not just one. Um, anyway, it came out in June, and if you remember everything I just said that all of those people said, they said it wouldn't sell, they said it wouldn't, people wouldn't like it, well, this book sold quite a lot, and it won Book of the Year and it won the Blue Peter Book Award, which meant I got my Blue Peter badge. I don't know if you can see, that was very exciting. That was a childhood dream come true. Um, and I get letters and emails every single day from people saying, I love this book. I recognize myself in this book. And so all of those people were wrong. And I, I always make sure I tell that story before I talk to people at schools because we all feel like that sometimes, don't we? We all feel like we want to do something and that it would be a good thing to do and that it would be the right thing to do. And there's negative voices and naysayers and people who say, no, you're wrong, you're not right about that. And it's so important <laughs> to not listen to them <laughs> and to go ahead anyway and keep trying. Because uh, if I had listened to them, a kind of spark wouldn't be here. Show us who you are wouldn't be here, which is great. Like I said, it just came out and people say they prefer it to a kind of spark already, which is good you know I wouldn't have my blue peter badge and I wouldn't be here talking to you guys so I always start my my Q&A's with schools with that story because it was really difficult sometimes to keep going but I'm so glad I did so that's my little introduction um I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have about anything like fire away there's absolutely no silly questions so um I'll hand back now but thank you that was really great. Thank you so much for that introduction. I think, um, obviously, I'll hand over to the children in a minute, but because I'm such a big fan, I've got loads of questions as well. Um, uh, yeah, massive thank you. I think just what you said there, kind of obviously from um, the book point of view, is obviously something that we're looking at a lot in detail as well. But all that extra stuff that you just said about resilience and determination and kind of fighting for what you believe in, I think, is obviously for children this age is really, really important. So thank you so much for that. And having more role models for us to share with the children that do do those kind of things is, you know, a massive bonus as a teacher. It kind of gives us a little <laughs> bit of something extra to give to them. So it's not just me banging on at them all the time. <laughs> um, right, um, can we just start off with a really simple question about, it is about a kind of spark. Um, and I just wondered if you could talk to us about how much Addy was based on your own experiences. Definitely. Um, Addy is, so if, you, if you've read it, you'll know she's a great kid. She's really smart and sweet and kind. She's much, much better of a person than I am. I'm very flawed. I'm probably a little bit more like Addy's older sister, Kitty. But um, Addy is, it's so incredible how amazing people have been about Addy. People write and say how much they love her and they want to be like her. And she's, you know, they want her to be their best friend. And it's lovely. Um, I'd say the parts of me that are like Addie are the parts where she gets very emotional about things and has a lot of sensory kind of feelings. So there's a scene in the book, I think chapter five, um, it's been a while since I've read it, but um, she's learning about the witch trials for the first time really and she's, she's feeling so much um, emotion hearing about the history of the witch trials. That's very similar to how I felt when I was her age. Um, I found history a very intense subject sometimes because it was so um, unbelievable to imagine what people used to do. Um, so I think we are alike in that sense. That we were both neurodivergent in the very, you know, similar ways. Um, but she's a lot more patient than me. She's a lot more 
um yeah a little bit more well behaved than I was when I was that age um but uh but no I I really really love her and I love that people people respond to her the way they do but I'm probably a bit more like her older sister <laughs> yeah, that's great we've actually just very recently read that chapter i can't remember if it was today or Good. um but it, it's the bit that sticks with me from that chapter is where she's she's constantly out of a seat and caught and sort of calling out which is obviously something as teachers you know we have had the conversation with my class i try and encourage that enthusiasm and it's kind of a you know very much a, a taboo a taboo thing isn't it but i think trying to encourage that is is, is great and actually as part of our as a, a separate subject we've been doing um, the Victorians in school and actually some of the the subject content is quite grim and quite dark and we you know we have had people in the class that have found that quite tough and I'm sure that's that's yeah. something that you can relate to it's kind of that um definitely you know, yeah because it was all it, yeah it's a lot yeah definitely yeah. relate yeah, fab. Right, I'll stop talking now then. Has anybody in my room first? There's loads and loads and loads of questions in this room. Oh, um, amazing. Questions. Um, Emma, do you want to start with yours, darling? Come down to the front so you can um, so you can see. Come and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Hi, Emma. Hi. Um, was... was Emily based on a true character? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think she was based on quite a few people. Um, you know, I'm sure you know an Emily and Emma. I'm sure everyone knows one. Um, yeah, you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, they, they, she's based on a few people um, that I... I had a really tough time when I was your age from about nine to 12. I had lots of bullies and they were very clever bullies. They weren't the kind of bullies that pushed you down the stairs or threw you in a locker or anything that you could, you know, tell a teacher about. They were very clever in the way that they bullied. And so Emily's based on a lot of those people. She's not based on one person. And um, that's some advice if you're writing a book is not to base characters on one specific person because they usually will find out. Um, but Emily's based on a, a bunch of people. And um, and unfortunately, yeah, they were, they were real people. But, you know, I'm so much happier now. And I look back when I was on the, that time when I was nine, 10, 11, and I thought, oh, it was so difficult. You know, I just wish I could go back and tell her like, it's okay, it will all get better. Um, but yeah, Emily's based on some real, real bullies. And um, yeah, I, I'm not going to spoil any, I don't want to talk about what happens later in the book, because people maybe haven't read it yet. But um, she is, yes, she's very real. Thank you, Emma. Great question. Yeah. Thank you. It sparked a lot of conversations in our class around that, around Emily and how, you know, yeah. uh, some of the things that she does um, have quite shocked our children here. But then it's, you know, it's having that, again, something, another really important conversation about how you treat people that are maybe a little bit different. Um, exactly. Uh, Eddie, do you want to come and ask, ask this question? You could probably shout it from there, mate. Eddie's this, this guy here. <laughs> Hi, Eddie. <laughs> Is the character Miss Murphy inspired by real people? <laughs> so Miss right. Murphy again we've had some quite shocking reactions <laughs> to Miss Murphy in here but yes. <laughs> Miss, Miss Murphy is and I always get nervous when I talk to schools about Miss Murphy she's <laughs> she's um very much a fictional um character you would not be able to get away with the things that she gets away with in real life um she's she's very much a storybook villain but she's a little bit based on on some of the things I, you would hear as as a neurodivergent kid back in back in ye old 90s when I was you know small um there were a lot of people maybe of the older generation who didn't quite understand uh what it meant to have a learning difficulty or what it meant to be autistic they just thought that it was a label that was put on on certain and they really didn't understand how to how to deal with that in the classroom but she's she's not real um don't worry um she's she's very much a storybook uh baddie um and and again we see it through Addie's eyes so everything feels very intense um you know from Addie's point of view but also I I, I hate to have to stick up for Miss Murphy but um she oh. taught Addie's older sister um a few years prior and she was a really tough student so I think Miss Murphy is maybe a little bit scarred from teaching Kitty so when she sees another um Darrow child in the classroom she kind of thinks oh no I'm in for another year of pain um but no she's not not real and certainly I I am just been so lucky with the incredible teachers um that have supported my books so uh very very much fictional but um hopefully a, a good fun baddie 
<laughs> yeah, thanks for that. And I have to say from a teacher's point of view, I'm quite relieved you said she's not real because <laughs> that would have been a real panic. But I know when I first read your book, it was in first lockdown last year. I remember really clearly reading it. And it does kind of, from my from a teacher's point of view, it made me reflect on my how I speak to certain children sometimes and trying to think, not obviously, not, I know I never did anything to that extent, but it does make <laughs> you realise how you know, how things can be misinterpreted sometimes. So again, yeah. thank, you, thank you for that. Um, yeah. Do you want to come and ask your question, darling? This is, this is, a, this is a great question, I think. <laughs> Something okay. about good discussions about. <clears throat> this is Blythe. Hi. Hi. Addy is very interested in sharks and witches. They are very misunderstood creatures and people. Does this reflect how Addy feels? Very much so, and that's a really good question and a really clever insight into the story. Um, yes, they do definitely reflect how Addy feels. Um, sharks are, we'll start with sharks before we get to witches, but sharks are very misunderstood animals. And um, I'm sure you've all, if you haven't seen of the film, you will have all at least heard of the film Jaws. I think everyone knows that film. Um, people are nodding, good, yes. Um, Jaws came out in the 70s, which is, you know, 50 years ago now. And before that, people really didn't know anything about sharks, really didn't know a lot about sharks. And then Jaws came out and suddenly everybody wanted to rent a boat and go out and kill sharks. And sharks were being killed in the millions after people saw Jaws and they would hold the sharks up and say, look, we've killed, we've killed Jaws just like in the film. Millions of sharks got killed. And they are nothing like how they are portrayed in the film. They are very clever, intelligent animals and they don't want to eat people. Um, so they're hugely maligned. They're hugely misunderstood. And Addy finds them very interesting, as I do, clearly. She thinks they're very cool, but she also does exactly as you've just noticed. She relates to them because she thinks, I feel like that sometimes. I feel like everybody's been told a, a bad story about me and it's not true. And they, they have that story in their head and they won't let it go. And I have to work really hard to prove that that story isn't true. And that's the same for the witches. Um, you know, they were not witches, these people. <laughs> I'm sure we all know that now, but they were just quite vulnerable people and, and they were misunderstood and, and they couldn't defend themselves from, from other people's opinions. So absolutely Addy relates to sharks and witches in that sense and she, she feels misunderstood the way they are and she feels sometimes a little bit attacked the way they are as well. Um, so that was a really, really good question and a really clever insight into the book. Thank you. That's great. And I think obviously what you said in your introduction, that, that kind of even means even more to us now from what the kind of battle you had to go through getting the book published. You can kind of see that that reflected in the, in what I did there. Um, Jay, do you want to ask your question? Sorry, other classes I will hand over to you in a minute, but we've got a lot of <laughs> children in here. <laughs> um, Hi. Who's your role model? Ooh, um... It's a lady called Dolly Parton. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's a, she's a country singer. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. I love that. <laughs> um, but um, also I had, um, actually, for those of you that are reading the book, there's a character in the book called Mr. Allison, yeah. who's yeah. a librarian. Yeah. Yeah. He is based on my primary six teacher. Primary six is in Scotland. I think it's year seven in England. Um, I'm not sure. Year five. I don't know. <laughs> primary um, but he was my teacher and he read to us every week and he would get so into the book he was reading he would get climb up on the desk and he would do all these voices he was the most incredible teacher and he really kick-started my love of writing and and reading for pleasure and so I think of him a lot now that I'm talking about this book um I really do have so much to thank him for and he's still teaching and I, I hope he one day gets a copy of this. Um, we've sent him one, but I think he's at a different school now. Um, I really hope he can read it one day and, and know that he really made that, that happen. Um, so Dolly Parton, who I think is the greatest living poet and also the real Mr. Allison. <laughs> Great answer. Very, I'm sure he'll be pleased to know he's been mentioned in the same breath as Dolly Parton as well. <laughs> it's quite a nice compliment. Honour. <laughs> yeah, absolute bonus. Come on then, Jacob. Right. Jacob is, um, Jacob's a boy in my class who, uh, because of reading your book, he actually made his own presentation about his own autism. Um, and he's, he's actually made a, a YouTube video that's gone out to the whole school today. So really, really proud of this young man at the moment. 
um, and he's kind of talking up for, for what it's like. Have you got a question, mate, or do you um, want to say hello? I was just going to ask a question, like, what was, like, the feeling while creating the book? That's a lovely question. That's a great question, Jacob, <laughs> and it's so <laughs> nice to meet you. Yep. Um, so great to hear about your presentation. That's so brave, much braver than I was when I was your age. How did it feel to write the book? It felt really good. Um, it felt really liberating. It felt like I was talking about things and writing things and explaining things that I hadn't really taken the time to think about for a long time before that. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd kept a lot of it inside. So writing the book felt really great and really liberating. Um, and like something was was being released and and I think that's exactly what you want when you write a story um so that's a fantastic question and no one's asked me that before so thank you for asking me that and it's so great to meet you if if you're interested at all I could actually send you the link to Jacob's presentation Please if you're interested in watching it I could do that after after the zoom meeting I think yeah, a lot of I what that. you said like Jacob is completely obsessed with animals and wildlife and animal welfare <laughs> Um, so there's a lot of similarities there as well. Um, yeah, so I think you might have a lot in common <laughs> with, with that. Jacob. <laughs> um, Jess. Jess is quite tall, so I always have to alter the camera. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm tall as well. <laughs> um, is there any positives of being autistic? Oh, definitely. That's a good question. There definitely are. Um, I think the reason that I can write books is because I'm neurodivergent and because that's the way my brain works creatively. Um, I'm not very good at getting on trains. I'm not very good at loud noises. I'm not very good at uh, big groups of people, but I'm very, very good at the arts. I'm very good at creative things. And a lot of autistic and neurodivergent people are, you know, a lot of autistic people are very good at maths so or they're very good at uh, memory. And then others can be extremely creative, um, much, much more creative than maybe someone who isn't autistic. And, and that's a huge, huge talent to have. And um, so there are many, many positives. I have a good memory um, that sometimes freaks people out a little bit because I can remember things very vividly. Um, I can hear much better and, and smell much, much more strongly than a lot. You know, I mean, I can smell things very, very powerfully that, you know, my, my friends get a little freaked out sometimes because I can always, you know, smell when food's coming or I can tell when the doorbells get like, just got like a sixth sense about things. Um, there are many, many positives. And I think sometimes people get too hung up on the negatives. People who are not autistic or they're not neurodivergent, they get a little bit too um, over enthusiastic focusing on the negative things. And a lot of the negative things are outside forces. So things that the outside world is doing that is not helpful to people who are a bit different. And if we all kind of worked a bit more to fix those things, there would be even more positives about being neurodivergent. A lot of incredible people are neurodivergent. Um, Albert Einstein was neurodivergent. Um, Alan Turing, who was one of the creators of the computer, was neurodivergent. There are so many incredible people in history who had brains that work differently and we absolutely need those people. I mean, I'm not saying I'm anything like that. I'm just writing stories, but um, they really, you know, look at Greta Thunberg. She's also autistic and she's changing the world with her climate activism. Um, it's, it's incredibly important to understand there are lots of positives. So thank you so much for asking me that because I don't get to answer that question very often. Yeah, we like to, me and Jacob have a chat, we could like to call it your superpower, don't we, mate? <laughs> superpower. Um, just, I know there's loads of questions in my classroom. I just wondered if anybody from any of the other classes has got any questions, um, just to give you guys a chance as well. Uh, Mrs Spellman, do you want to go, go for something? Yes, please. Um, Lewis, would you like to uh, come and read out your question, please? Hi Lewis. Hello. How hard was it for you to grow up? How hard was it? Um, it was really, really great for the most part. I have a really nice home and a really nice family and some really great pets. But um, school was quite hard when I was your age. It was very difficult. Um, and unlike Addie in A Kind of Spark, I did not have the 
the the knowledge how to explain why it was hard i just i knew that the school bell was too loud i knew that there were too many social um aspects involved in school i knew that there was too much uh to process and not enough time to process it so i knew these things i just didn't know how to articulate them and how to tell people so school was very difficult and there were bullies like i said and bullies are are really really tough and i moved schools when i was nine and that was difficult because I didn't know any of the kids at my new school and they really took a long time to get used to me and um, so school was, was hard um, but it got much much better and um, and all the all the hard stuff makes really good research for writing books so it's all going it's all going in a good place um, but I also did a lot of theatre when I was your age and that was such an incredible um, hobby and such a great um, release of all that kind of upset and tension and I'm sure lots of you watching love drama and love theatre and and um, I just I'm always a big advocate and say do that for as long as you can as much as you want because it's such a great great skill to have and it really helps you um, but yeah growing up was tough growing up is tough you know you guys have got it tough as well it's it's a, you know it's difficult it's not all fun um, but uh, yeah but it does it helped make me the writer I am now. But thank you for that question, Liz. Thank you. Uh, this one kind of follows on from that. Um, Noah, would you like to read out your question, please? Did your teachers treat you differently because of your autism? Well, at the time, they didn't know that's what was different about me. Um, it took a while to get that diagnosis, and I got diagnosed with something else first. Um, I think they knew there was something a bit different because a few of them would always make comments and go like, oh, you're a bit odd aren't you or you're a bit different and they didn't really know how to help and that was the difficult thing um is that teachers really want to help all their students and sometimes you know this was 20 years ago now and we knew far less about neurodiversity 20 years ago than we do now um and they just didn't really know how to help me so they put me in lots of like handwriting workshops and said you know write this over and over again and they just didn't understand why I wasn't improving because it wasn't anything to do with laziness it wasn't anything to do with not trying it was just I didn't have that those motor skills and um the teachers just didn't really know they just thought everything we try with this child doesn't seem to work um but the only thing that did work was was letting me do arts was letting me do music and writing and drama um so my teachers really tried <laughs> to, to help but I think that they were really fighting an uphill battle because we didn't really know what to do um it's nothing like it is now where teachers are much much more um you know educated and trained about about neurodiversity but thank you for that question yeah thank you thank you very much um we, we have got um, another couple of questions, but uh, Miss Busby, if you want to move on to another class first and then maybe come back to us. Yeah, I think we'll have, like have a go. It's all afternoon, by the way. <laughs> questions in here. Um, yes, we'll do, Miss Robin. Um, Miss Tim, have you, have you got anything in your mind? Miss Tim, no. Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have got a couple of questions. We have quite a few, but if you've gone through, a few of them have been answered already. Yeah. But Chiara's got a question. Do you want to come and ask one, Chiara? Uh, how long did it take you to write your first book? Wow. Um, well, the first draft was really quick. The first draft was only a few days because, you know, you can see it's not a very big book. It's quite small compared to my new one. It's quite much more chunky. Um, so this one took a couple of days to write the first draft. And then when the publishers got hold of it, it took, let me see if I remember, it took from November till about February, so about three months. And that was going, you know, back and forth and back and forth with the editor. And she would say, change this or put this in. And, you know, um, that's how publishing works. We go back and forth over a few months. So this one took, I would say four months. And then this one, this one just came out, but I wrote it in the first lockdown. So I started in March and I finished in August um and then kept editing till November. So this one took much longer. This one was nine months longer and it's why it's much bigger um but it's my lockdown book and I'm really proud of it and every time I look at it I remember that first lockdown and how how difficult it was and how scary it was and and um and how much better I feel now um and this was my my lockdown book um 
but it took a lot longer and it's much bigger. So it really does depend on the book. Um, some books can take, you know, a month, some can take years. And I have friends who are writers and it takes them years sometimes to write a book. Um, so there's no rule, but, uh, but that, was, that was Spark. It took about four months, I would say. Thank you, it's a great question. Hey, Steve, did you have a question? We have got loads of questions, well, by the way, so, so we'll just ask a couple as well, and then we can move on to another task in Femme Chat. Hi. Hi. It said that nobody would read a book about autistic people or crisis. Sorry, can you say that one more time? Louder. Did the people that said nobody would read a book about autistic people regret saying that? Ah, really good question and one I would love to know the answer to as well. Um, very luckily for them, we've all been in lockdown so we haven't been in the same room. Um, but I can't wait to meet those people again and ask them, you know, do you like my badge? I'll say, do you like my Blue Peter badge? Remember me? Um, <laughs> no. Um, but no, I think they, publishers are very cautious. They're very nervous about publishing anything that they feel might rock the boat. Um, except my publishers, they constantly rock the boat. They're not scared at all. So I, they weren't saying it to be mean. They were just saying it because, you know, to them it was something scary and something different. And, um, and I just feel kind of sorry for them because the book did really well. That could have been them. They could have, they could, you know, they could, they could have had that success, but uh, but they didn't. So um, I can't wait to see them all again when things open up. But um, yeah, it's always good to be gracious. <laughs> yeah, I think the blue, blue Peter badge definitely speaks for itself, doesn't it? <laughs> it's my favourite thing. It's <laughs> great. Uh, Mrs. Richardson, anybody in your room? Yes, please, if you don't mind. Yes, of course. Awesome. And um, why was Nina so rude to AD about her autism? Um, I think Nina is so if people if anyone doesn't know the book, Nina is one of Addie's older sisters. She has two and they're twins. Nina is 18 years old, and when you get to be 18, you're a little bit all over the place. You're a little bit grumpy when maybe you wouldn't be grumpy when and I think Nina does not mean to be mean. She doesn't realize that she's being mean. She's just very stressed and very, um, you know, she spends a lot of time online, doesn't she? She's a vlogger. So she's always listening to other people's opinions about herself. And she's very um, too much on social media and too much online. And I think that sometimes affects the way that she relates to real people and makes her a little bit meaner than she would want to be. I don't think she means to be that mean. And um, not to spoil the book, but she gets her moment in the end of the book. Um, but she's just a grumpy teenager. And, and, you know, I remember being 18 and just being mad at everybody. And that's just, that was what it was like. So she doesn't really mean to be mean. But, um, but I think she also feels a bit left out because Addie and Kitty are so close and they have such a good friendship and they, they are so, you know, together. And I think Nina feels a bit left out sometimes. But that's a great question. Thank you. Also, I think you're a really good publisher. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Bye, been down there. Hi. What's your favourite book to read and why? Oh, that's the hardest question. Oh, um, oh. There's a book called Anne of Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery. It's there's a Netflix series called Anne with an E, which is based on it. Um, some people, I think, were nodding. Maybe some people know. Um, I love that book. I read that a lot. Little Women is a book I read a lot. Um, but I try now that I'm older, and because there's so many great books coming out, I try not to reread as much as I used to. So I'm always reading something new. Um, I just read a book called Amari and the Night Brothers by B.B. Alston, which was really good. It was, um, again, it's middle grade, so it's for people your age. And it was fantastic. It was such fun. Um, oh. But um, when I was your age, I was queuing up for Harry Potter books. You know, they pub the Harry Potter books were coming out when I was your age. And that was, you know, that was probably the most formative reading experience when I was a kid was just those books were, that was your year. Everybody waited for those books to come out. Um, but I try to keep reading new things now. But um, Anna Green Gables is one I always go back to. Thank you for asking that, that brilliant but very difficult question. <laughs> Thank you. And one last one for now. How do you calm down? Do you read like 
Adidas. How do I calm down? Um, that's a really good question because I'm still learning because of lockdown. Um, I love music. Music really helps me. And when I was your age, if I didn't have my little MP3 player or my Walkman when I was going to school, I would absolutely lose it because I'd get so worried that I wouldn't be able to use it to calm down and to stay, stay focused. So music is a really big thing for me in calming down. I love music. Um, and also animals. Animals are really great for helping calm down and to be relaxed. Um, I'm not you know, able to have a pet at the moment, but I really feel the benefit of having a pet because animals just really, really, I'm sure lots of you have pets you love and they really keep you calm, don't they? Really good question, thank you. And I really like your books. Oh, thanks, sweetheart. Thank you. Right, can we go back to my class now? Because <laughs> there's a lot of, <laughs> lots of fans. <laughs> um, Josh, come on then, mate. So, Josh, I actually introduced Josh um, a few months ago to your book, and I think you read it in about two days. Yeah. Did you the whole thing? Uh, so, Josh is um, an avid reader, a reading for pleasure, a kind of, you know, when it's time to do some maths or something, I have to drag him away from a book sometimes, <laughs> which is quite a nice thing to do. Um, oh, so Josh, that's yeah, brilliant. Is, is the right little superstar. So I wanted to introduce you to him, but I think he's also got a question, haven't you? Yeah. Amazing. Um, what's your hobby except for writing? Oh, good one. Well done, dude. Good question, Josh. Um, well, I don't know about you guys, but I've not been able to do that much in the last 12 months, but... Um, I love film and cinema. I love going to the cinema and then sitting with friends and talking about everything we just watched. I love making um, jewellery. Um, so that's something I do with my hands and that really keeps me you know, calm and I just make, make jewellery. Um, I love reading, just like you, Josh. You sound exactly like I was when I was your age. Um, I love going, I live in London and I love going for walks in London around all the incredible things that we have. And that's about it, because writing takes up so much of my time. You know, it takes a, you know, a lot of time. Um, but before I was a professional writer, writing was my hobby. So, it, you know, it's always good to think about finding a way to do something you love and, and making that your job. Um, and I'm lucky enough to do that. But um, yeah, I can't wait for things to start opening up again. And I'll be going back to bookshops and back to cinemas and back to the theatre because I love theatre. I love going to, to see things in the theatre. Um, so yeah, those, those are my hobbies. Uh, what are your hobbies, Josh, apart from reading? Um, I just, um, uh, just reading, just reading lots of books. I like writing as well, don't you? I like reading, writing. Comics. 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 Awesome. He's a bit of an all-round entertainer, is Josh, aren't you? He's our, our comedian. He likes the little comedy shows for us. Amazing. <laughs> and falling over, yeah. Some of the hobby. <laughs> I've never seen him that shy, to be honest. He's normally very chatty. <laughs> That's cute. Um, Wilfie, come on down. Yeah, welcome to see Hi. There we go. Um, did all... Uh... COVID affect your autism? Oh, Is it? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I got COVID, I'll say that. I, I got it very early on in March and it was really, really difficult and it was not fun, but got through it and it's, you know, all okay now. Did it affect my, well, well, I don't think of me and my neurodiversity as being different things. We're all just, it's all one thing. So did it affect me? It was hard to have the routine change you know I, autistic people like their routines and I, I didn't like suddenly um, I mean my life didn't change that much because I'm a writer I just sit in the, in, in the house all day anyway but I, I didn't I didn't like that I couldn't go and see friends or family and that that routine change was very difficult and I think that probably hit autistic people very hard if they you know especially autistic people who are your age because they would have to say you know I'm suddenly suddenly I'm not going to school and that's really difficult you know all overnight for that to change to happen um but you know it's been hard for everyone and um it's really great now that the vaccine is is has, is here but um yeah I don't think it affected me too too differently to other people so it's quite hard for everyone but um that's a really really interesting question thank you for asking Luckily for us, it sounds like you managed to get the most of the uh, most of your second book done. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I got something done. <laughs> um, Isla, oh, we might need to check. I think we might have asked this question already. Let's look at I can't remember what it is. Somebody in another class might have pinched this question from us. I think. Let's have a look. 
Yeah, well, you can you can just say hello anyway. Uh, her question was about just say hi. Hi. There we go. This hi is Ella. <laughs> so just just read your question anyway, and I think we've kind of already answered what it. What children's book inspired you to be an author? Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, that is slight, that is a slightly different question. I think the one that inspired me to be an author was probably, oh, there's a book that, this might get me in trouble and we're being recorded, but, you know, ho-hum. Um, there was a book that came out when I was just a bit older than you called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. It's a very long title. Um, it's about a boy who's autistic and everyone kept giving it to me and going, you should read this because the character in it's very like, you know, he's different like you. And I read it and I thought, this isn't like me at all. You know, it's an interesting book. It's fun. It's got lots going on. But I thought this isn't, I don't think I'm like this at all. I don't relate to this in any way. And I think that book kind of inspired me to be a writer because I thought we can't just have one book with an autistic character in it for the next 50 years. We've got to have more, especially for girls. Um, so in a weird way, that book inspired me to be a writer because I thought, you know, it's great that that book is done so well, but we need to have more than just that. Um, so that's a, that's a good question actually, because I can talk about that. Thank you. Thanks, Isla. Uh, Lily. I had a hand up for about 40 minutes. <laughs> Lily. <laughs> What's your favourite book that you've written? That you've written. That I've written. Yeah. Okay, actually, it's the latest one. It's Show Us Who You Are, because I love A Kind of Spark. Of course I do. It's my first. But um, this one's got more adventure in it, and it's got more um, kind of plot twists in it and there's a really interesting villain in it that that is not like Miss Murphy we don't know that they're a villain at the beginning and it's got this great friendship like this is a really exciting book and there's a lot going on in it it's got sci-fi in it you know science fiction and um so this one's my favorite um I'm currently working on book three and it's giving me such a hard time and it's not my favorite but hopefully when it comes out it will be my favorite but right now it's show us who you are um because spark got so much attention um i feel bad for show us who you are but hopefully it will have its day as well but um that one's my favorite one i've written thank you very hard question <laughs> we've got we've got show us who you are lined up for when we've finished oh amazing it. i won't spoil it then <laughs> it might have 32 extra extra fans after that one as well Awesome. Um, oh, goodness me, there's so many hands up. <laughs> Let's go to another question for a minute. Give, give somebody else a chance. Uh, Mrs. Spellman, do you want to go back to you? Uh, Janae's got a question. Bit of an unusual question. Oh. Okay. Hi. In your first book, was there ever a good side of to the main character's autism? Was there ever a, uh, what was it after that? A good side. Um, was there ever a good side to the main character's autism? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I definitely think there was a good side. Um, I think it's what makes, we're talking about kind of spark, I think it's what makes Addie really empathetic. It's what makes her a good listener. It's what makes her a good friend. She's a really good friend to Audrey, um, who's new at school. It's what makes her stand up for herself. I think there's tons of good things. Um, and again, the bad things, they tend not to have anything to do with Addie's autism. They tend to do with other people's attitudes. Um, so I think there's tons of good stuff. Um, and hopefully, um, if any of you want to pick it up and read it, you'll, you'll learn that Addie's a really good friend and a really good pal. And, um, and there's so many good sides to her. But that's a great question, Janaid. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, shall we go to Mrs Tidmus? Hello, sorry. Yeah, we've got some more questions, so we're going to go to Ramai. Ramai, can I ask you a question? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Was it um, hard to concentrate as a child with your autism? Yeah, it was hard to concentrate. Um, it was especially hard to concentrate on things that I just didn't find interesting. And I know that sounds really universal. I know that we all kind of feel that, but I honestly feel when I was your age, um, 
when people started to talk about things I didn't find interesting, my brain would just switch off and would go, right, no, we're not listening. This is not this is not information that's worth retaining, um, which is obviously not great for when you're in school. But yeah, I had a really tough time concentrating. And when I did like something, I really liked it and I was really engaged and really interested. And the teachers was always say to me at parents evening, they would say, why are you so good in this class and so bad in this one? It doesn't make sense. And I would say my brain switches off and I honestly can't control it. Um, so I had a really tough time concentrating, but, um, you know, it gets better the more you practice, the more you realize I just have to sit through this no matter what, <laughs> and, I, and it'll benefit me if I just do the best I can. Um, but yeah, tough time concentrating, and that's quite common with kids that are neurodivergent. We sometimes have hard, hard times focusing on things that we don't find useful or interesting. <laughs> A bit stubborn in that sense. But good question. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of nods in this room when there. No, <laughs> lots of people relating. <laughs> lots of people relating to that. Um, Miss Richardson, anybody in your room? Yes, please, Alfie. Hello. Hi. Um, when did you realize? What? Well, when did people realize you had autism? Um, I was talking about this with my family last night. Um, people always sort of knew there was something different, but girls are very difficult to diagnose. Girls are much harder to diagnose than boys. A lot of what we understand about autism, we understand it because of studying boys. And, um, and there are slight differences in, in boys and girls in the way that they present. So people knew that there was something different and I got diagnosed with a learning difficulty first, which people spotted, um, but they didn't quite spot autism. They didn't quite know that's what it was because they thought, well, she can sometimes make eye contact and she can sometimes, you know, get by in social situations or, you know, so it probably can't be autism, but it, it was. And, um, and one of the things that's so important about Spark and also about show is that they teach people that autistic people are all very different and they don't always look and behave in the same way. They aren't always people who love trains and maths, although that's totally cool. Um, they sometimes are girls that love um, horses or rain like any kind of girly things, but they don't always look the way you would expect. So I think that's why it took a long time for people to work out what was what was different about me, because um, girls hide it a little bit better. Um, that's a whole conversation, but um, but that's that's the the quick answer. Um, and again, like I said just before, twenty years ago, people didn't know what they know now. It was still relatively new, and people really were still learning about it. Um, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, and what's your new book called? My the latest one or the one I'm writing? The one you're writing. Oh, I'm, it's not got a title yet, but it's um, it's. What am I allowed to say? This is being recorded, so I'm very careful. <laughs> um, it's not got a title just yet, um, and I my publishers never like my titles anyway, so it would change. But it's um, it's a fantasy. It's it's a magical story set set in modern day with with magic and, and exciting stuff happening. So um, coming out in February next year, um, but I, I I don't have a title just yet, and I, and it would change anyway. But um, it's got a little boy in it called Marley. And the reason he's called Marley is because I did a school visit with a, a school in Scotland and Marley was so great and so animated. And I said, Marley, I have to name a character after you. So that will be in the next oh, book. Uh, great question. Oh. We've got some very jealous people in here now that want to be in <laughs> some of your books, I think. Um, Miss Busby, right. can I just have one more, please? Oh yeah, sorry, of course. Yeah, go for it. Hi. Did you ever get frustrated whilst you were writing? Oh yes, <laughs> all the time, because I know a lot of you watching this will be writers as well. You get to that sort of, you write the beginning and it feels really good and it feels really exciting and you're like, this is good, I like this. And then you get, you know, a few chapters in and you're like, oh no, the the inspiration's gone and I'm just left with with the hard work um so I get frustrated a lot um sometimes characters don't do what you want them to do um sometimes you know the words just don't even come especially in lockdown um so I find it best when I get frustrated I'm like okay it's time to step away and time to watch a really good film or read a really good book or talk to friends um but frustration happens a lot if you are writers or you want to be writers don't worry about being frustrated. It's very common um, and it's part of the process. <laughs> but good question, thank you. Thank you. 
Right, I'm very aware that our time, I can't believe how quickly that has gone. And um, just going to end with two more people that I did promise could ask a question. Taylor, do you want to come and do yours? First of all. Come on, quickly. <laughs> there we go. Hey, um, have you ever felt like you asked, you had to rush a story at, and have you ever started worrying that it's not going to be out in time? That's a really good question. I, I tend to be okay with deadlines. I, I like deadlines. I like the structure. Um, some writers don't. I am pr usually pretty good. I usually get the book in a, f a few days early, but my current deadline is the end of May. And I also have a short story that I have to write for someone that's due at the end of May. And I'm feeling a little bit nervous that I might be, you know, have to rush a little bit because there's a lot to do. Um, so this might be the first time I feel a bit rushed, but usually I, I'm pretty good with deadlines and also publishers, at least my publishers, they're really understanding, especially with lockdown and COVID and everything. You know, if you just say, I need a little bit more time, they'll give it to you because they're very nice. Um, if any of you go on to work in publishing, you know, it's, it's, there are lots of lovely people and we all listen to each other. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't feel too rushed, but um, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm like, is this going to come together? But it always does. So uh, that's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, Adam, did you want to come ask yours, mate? Oh, it's already been asked. Fabulous. Uh, right, one more then. Final, final question before we run out of time. Faith? Yeah, I don't worry. <laughs> Unusual walk to the camera, that was Faith. More of a gallop, I would say. <laughs> Do Nina and Addy fight a lot? Nina and um, that's a good question. I don't think Nina and Addy fight a lot. I think Nina and Kidi fight all the time. And one thing I can tell you guys that I like to do when I'm writing a book is I write lots of scenes um, or chapters that will never make it into the final draft, but I write them so that I know what is going on behind the scenes in the story. So there's a lot of deleted scenes of Nina and Kiri having massive arguments where they throw things at each other and they scream at each other the way teenagers do. And then, um, and then that's why in some parts of the book they're quite frosty to each other because they've just had a massive fight. Um, so Nina and Addy, they, Addy doesn't really fight with people. Addy's very... Um, level-headed she doesn't you know I think you would have to do something really bad to make Addy angry um but Nina and Kiji they fight constantly and they're twins right so they get really they really know each other they know exactly how to push each other's buttons um so I had a good time writing a lot of those fight scenes they never hurt each other but they love to fight <laughs> but that's a good question thank you Faith Right, I'm, I know uh, we've, uh, we're very nearly out of time, so I just want to say a massive, massive thank you from everybody here at, at Chelliston Junior School and uh, for our Year 5 children. I think, um, obviously, you know, your book, we are really, really into it. And from a teaching point of view, just getting children involved in, you know, enjoying reading for, for a start is obviously a massive bonus. Um, but I think the book's inspired so many other things. So obviously we've got that kind of, the, the, the neurodivergent you know that is a, that is an obviously an issue for some children and something that we're, we're trying to raise awareness about and discuss a lot more so thank you massively for giving us something to kind of put those conversations on as well and um, you know it's kind of gives you a kind of a way in as a teacher to have those conversations which is amazing um also we've you've sparked a bit of an interest in the uh, witchcraft and sharks in our class as well we've got a lot of a lot of research going on around those uh, those topics Love it. which is great and um, just before i let you go well uh, harry has been busy making his own cover today just really wanted to show you just oh, amazing you, harry. Yeah, I, wrote, I wrote all facts about the people <gasps> <laughs> oh, wow that's amazing yeah. i'd love a picture of that that's incredible yeah we'll that's definitely really great. with the when i upload the video i can i can definitely send you that as well um, brilliant harry thank yeah, you hold on, hold on harry um it just kind of did that over lunchtime and i was like i definitely want to show you that because that's that's amazing um, amazing. and obviously we're really looking forward to reading uh show us who you are as well i mean oh. hopefully you sort of if things kind of go back to normal relatively soon it'd be great to get you in person maybe next year at some Love point it. so good and um, if we could maybe maybe arrange that that would be absolutely ama absolutely amazing um but i think as well obviously um you know the introduction you did at the start we've spoke to quite a few authors this year and i think sometimes 
you know, they're quite happy to talk about the books and things, but I think the backstory of, of what you said really um, has struck a chord with me about that sort of resilience and determination. And, and I think you could kind of see the faces in the room here, kind of, you know, a little bit of a little spark of inspiration there. So thank you so much for that. Um, I've still got like everybody's got the hand up. I know, I know you've got to go. So I will uh, I will try and field some of these questions this end. But um, I think just seeing the level of engagement and the excitement here today is, uh, you know, what it's all about, isn't it? So amazing. Thank um, you so much, everyone. Your questions were fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, and I will. I'll send you. A, I'm, I'll, I'm going to put this recording on Twitter later, uh, which I can tag you in. I can send you a picture of Harry's. Harry's work and I can send you the link to Jacob's presentation if, you, if you're Fantastic. interested in that as well. Um, Definitely. But for now everybody, do you just want to say a massive thank you and give her a wave or give everybody a chance to... Thank you! Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much! Bye! Thanks for